The search for your first compact tractor isn't easy, is it? As my dad would say, there's more brands than you can shake a stick at. And yeah, there are. In this episode, we're going to try to help you narrow those choices a little bit. We're not going to tell you exactly which brand to buy because, quite frankly, I don't care which brand you buy. But we are going to try to help you narrow and we're going to try to give you some guidelines to go by. Let's get started. That's right. While some commenters seem to think that I uh, uh, live and breathe by a particular brand, the green color, that's not true. I really don't care which brand you buy. What I would rather do is help you to select a brand and, and some of the, the things we're going to talk about here I think will help with that brand selection. And again, I don't care. So it's, it's, it's not going to make me any money either way, whether you buy an orange or a red or a blue or a green or are there any other colors? Probably are, but it's not going to matter. How then do we begin to select between all of these brands? Uh, I've got a few guidelines I think that can help. The first is that I would like to choose a brand that makes their own machine. And that, that will limit us a good bit, but it won't, it won't get us down to one or two, right? There are a lot of brands that do make their own machines. Uh, for example, Deere makes their own machines, Kubota makes their own machines, Coyote makes their own machines, LS, TYM. I would even go so far as to put Massey Ferguson in there, even though they do partner with Iseki because that partnership has lasted so long that I consider it a, a bond that won't be broken. So why do I care if they make their own brands? I'm concerned about uh, an agreement going bad in the longer term. So for instance, we could buy this RK tractor today and as long as everything's going fine, uh, you'll be able to get parts here from your RK, your Rural King dealer. But what if something gets rocky in the relationship between RK and TYM? It's entirely possible that uh, you won't be able to get parts anymore for these machines directly. You might have to go to TYM to get those parts. Well, some of the parts you'll be able to get. There'll be no question. I think the loaders are the same. I think you know the frame and the transmissions are the same. RK, though, has used a different engine in a lot of their machines than, than um, the TYM version. They replaced the engine, they went to a Yanmar engine, and I don't know what TYM was using in the same exact model. But it won't be just the engine, some of the connecting pieces, throttle connections and all would probably be different between different engine types. There are other upgrades in the RK machines over the TYM machines, and I'll use that term literally, they are upgrades. The seat's upgraded, they include a hydraulic outlet. I actually don't know all of the upgrades, but anything that has been changed from the TYM model will be specific to RK. Now, it still may be off the shelf parts. You may be able to get those replaced. I don't know. That's the point, I don't know. Yeah. Over the last, what, 15 years, 14 years, since 2008, uh, we haven't had really any hiccups in our economy. Yeah, the pandemic hit, but it really wasn't a hiccup in the compact tractor world. In fact, it made compact tractor buying boom. And so we haven't seen any downturns for a long time at this point. So brands seem to have been sticking with us for the long term, right? And that includes the, the rebranded, like the RK, like some of the other uh, brands have, they've continued. But what's going to happen in a downturn? We do have evidence from past history that some of these uh, brands that are not as committed, in other words, they don't have the investment in their own tractors, yeah, they might drop out. They might drop out when times get hard. We have an example, Real King had a previous tractor, I don't even know who made it. But they tried it and they got tired of it because of whatever reason, maybe the sales weren't up to their expectations or maybe the partnership fell apart. It, it, it didn't end well. If you got one of those tractors, you're gonna have trouble getting any support. Another example is Cub Cadet. They used to brand Yanmar tractors. And that relationship got rocky and got to the point where it became very, very difficult. Uh, the only way that uh, a dealer could stock parts was to become a Yanmar dealer. So Cub Cadet dealers, 
didn't want to become Yanmar. I don't even know. It's just details there, but I know that if you own one of those Cub Cadet tractors, uh, that's a that's a rebranded Yanmar. I think it's yellow, like Cub Cadets typically were. You're going to have some trouble getting parts. How about the Montana tractor? Yep, we've talked about that in earlier episodes in the past. It's going to be it's going to be hard to find parts for that Montana tractor. It's hard to even know it was sourced from LG, which may have become LS. But are they the same tractors? I, I don't know. It's just going to be difficult, right? Uh, if if you choose a tractor that's manufactured by somebody else and then that brand eventually that relationship is eventually says severed. You should be able to research for yourself whether the brand is manufacturing their own machines. Um, a couple more examples that I know that are not. The Bobcats are made uh, by Coyote although the loaders are a little bit different so it's not an exact copy of the whole machine. Also uh, the bad boy tractors are the same, I believe they're exact with the Branson tractors, maybe a seat difference. Um, I'm sure there are others that are replicas or rebranded from another machine and I, I won't have a complete list but that just gives you a, a, a starting point uh, for that topic. I would recommend avoiding a rebranded tractor. Next up is dealer and manufacturer support. I really think those are two different issues. Do you have a strong dealer for the brand you're investigating? Oftentimes that's the reason you're investigating a brand. You know the local dealer, you're happy with them, they're perhaps close to your house, or even if they're not, you feel like they're going to bend over backwards to help you. That's an important consideration and, and sometimes people will say, hey, it's all about the dealer, just make sure you've got a dealer that you can trust. It is important, but I don't think it's the all-important matter, right? Is there a manufacturer behind that dealer that's going to be able to help them? Sometimes the manufacturer doesn't have enough parts available. And it's not just because I'm talking supply chain issues here in 2022. Sometimes the manufacturer just doesn't prioritize having a good stock of parts in the USA. And if your tractor is going to be down for five weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks because you're, you're waiting on a, a part, that's, that's going to be difficult to deal with. And we're noticing that, especially here with the supply chain issues. But it, it's been an issue for several years. If, if, the, if the manufacturer doesn't have that level of parts available, then you may have to wait a long time. Even if those parts are still in production, you may have to wait. In addition to parts support, there is some service support. And what I mean is, is your local dealer is going to be pretty knowledgeable on these tractors, especially if they sell a lot of them and service a lot of them. But what if they need help? What if something is not behaving on your tractor the way you expect it to, and they don't know? Do they have a, a support network behind them at the manufacturer level that can help them? This is an area where the manufacturer has to invest, and it's expensive. It's expensive to do that investment for these manufacturers to get a good support system so that they can deal with uh, issues as they arise. For instance, uh, a slight change on a tractor may induce a new issue, and for them to be get that issue communicated through the whole uh, network is, is costly and, and requires a, a lot of time. So. I would try to, to make sure that you're choosing a brand that's, that's uh, got a lot of dealer support at the dealer level, but also has a lot of manufacturer support behind that. When we use the term good dealer, a lot of times people think that means a salesman that I can get along with. And it, it feels good to go into a dealership and to see a salesman to, that you've dealt with and to be able to greet him and say hello. But quite frankly, that's not everything it takes to be a good dealer. In fact, you can have a great relationship with your dealer and, well, not like your salesperson at all. <laughs> it's entirely possible. Uh, it's, it's about the service and support, right? That's where you're going to be doing most of your interaction in the long run. Your salesman or salesperson is not necessarily going to be your first point of contact in the long term. And you will need support on your tractor. There will be issues There'll be questions you'll have. Um, you'll have to have some support in an ongoing manner. It's not like a car, which you may never see your dealer again. Uh, you will most likely need the support of your dealer in an ongoing basis. The long-term value of these tractors is in their parts availability. You're going to have little things go wrong. After all, you're running into things, you're pushing things, you're pulling things. 
you're gonna break something. So how do we know whether this particular machine or any machine is gonna have long-term parts availability? The only ways that I know of are to, to look at the past, look at the backing of your manufacturer. How have they done in the past? Uh, do, they, do they carry parts for old machines now? Um, you know, and what we see is, is that major brands that have good backing will carry parts longer. But I think that's only half of the story. No matter what brand it is, the parts that they carry uh, are going to be the ones that are, they're still selling. Okay? I think you can read a little more into it. If a tractor sold in huge volumes when it was new, if it was a very popular model, you're going to find a lot of parts for that machine available even today. We can look at, uh, I don't know, for example, an M uh, Farmall. If you've never heard of that, don't worry about it, but it's a tractor from the 40s. You can still buy parts for that tractor because it was a very popular machine. If you have a 4020 John Deere from the early 60s, you can still buy a lot of parts for it. Probably not everything, but you can buy a lot of parts for it. And the ones you can't buy, you can get at a salvage yard because there's a bunch of them and, and there'll be a bunch of them that'll just be in salvage and you can find the parts you need there. What if you bought a tractor that they only sold 1,500 total and it's 20 years old now? Will you be able to get parts for that machine? I think that's gonna be a challenge. So what I would recommend is that you consider a brand that, and when you get to the model level, a model that is selling in volume. Okay, I think that's very important for the long-term support of your machine. You know, let's say the RK, even though it's a rebranded tractor, let's say they sell 100,000 of these this year. I guarantee you there will be parts for it. If they sell 1,000 of them total over the five, 10 year period, then parts availability is gonna be limited. You see how it's going there. So it's a little bit of a crystal ball, I guess, and trying to see into the future, but I really believe the near term thing is, is it a volume seller today? And that really is at the model level as well as at the manufacturer level. Another advantage of buying a very popular make and model is the amount of online support you get. You're going to find a lot more YouTube support, a lot more forum support, just a lot more information out there about a very popular tractor than you will about a less popular tractor. Now notice this discussion doesn't have anything to do with, with whether the tractor is technically better or not. It has to do with the popularity. And I think it's important that you consider the popularity of, of the model that you're buying. It's probably something nobody else has mentioned. But not only will you find more information for maintenance and uh, where to buy repairs and in just other information that you might have to pay for uh, if you're buying a, a less popular machine, but you'll also find third-party accessories. I find that a lot of our partners uh, are quite eager to make accessories for a tractor that sells in volume, and they're a little more hesitant when it comes to a tractor that may only sell 500 units a year or small numbers because their potential to make a profit is, is just not there. It costs the same amount of time for them to engineer a solution, and then if they can only sell, uh oh, I said solution. And then if they can only sell one or two or three of them, they're not gonna be able to recover that engineering cost. So you'll find more accessories, more upgrades, uh, more discussion of exactly which attachments fit and how well they perform for popular machines. Now to this point, I have not mentioned resale value. Resale value is kind of nebulous, right? It's hard to, it's hard to really know what that's gonna be and it's, it's not guaranteed in the short term what your resale value is going to be either way. You may take a machine that's uh, destined to have a poor resale value, but if it's just got 100 hours or 200 hours and it looks like new, somebody may pay you nearly new price for it. Okay, so it's, it's hard to know that. But in the long run, a lot of these items that I've mentioned is what's going to lead to good resale value. Quite frankly, it's all about parts availability in the very long term. If you can get parts for the machine, it'll still do the job. It's all about parts availability. It'll maintain its value. If a machine is questionable about getting parts, then 
the value tails off. And we see that again on the Cub Cadet machines. Uh, we see that on the Montana machines. Uh, when you see those sell at auction, they just don't bring much because people recognize, yeah, even if it runs, I don't know if I'll be able to get parts. So in the long run, part support drives resale value. It is not directly paint color, but then there becomes some relation to paint color because of the known support from different manufacturers. So that's why I didn't mention resale value first until now, because it's driven by a bunch of the factors that I've already discussed, primarily parts availability in the long term. I'm finding it really difficult to put a finger on the reliability comparison between different brands. I'm actually seeing a lot of good reliability no matter what brand it is. It doesn't seem to be anything specific to one given brand that has a lot more issues than another one. Just haven't seen that. If I could say that, oh, you know, brand X is a lot more reliable than brand Y, I would, but I, it's, that's really hard for us to say. You're going to have some issues with any tractor. You're going to have issues again because we use them hard because unlike a car who is oftentimes you know driven on the highway it doesn't face a lot of uh, a lot of abuse in that sense when we're digging out stumps and when we're pushing over trees and and driving through the woods dragging stuff on the bottom of the machine we're going to encounter challenges we're going to encounter breakages and so no matter what brand you choose you'll have some issues but quite frankly the main powertrain on a lot of these machines seem to be very similar in reliability. Notice we haven't talked anything about tractor features here. We haven't talked about the lift capacity of the three-point hitch. We haven't talked about the ground clearance. We haven't talked about the horsepower. Rather, we've talked at a higher level about the manufacturer. Well, I'm not suggesting that you uh, narrow it to a single manufacturer. I'm suggesting that you narrow your choices uh, by some of the guidelines we've shown here and then work within that to choose the specific models that you might want to compare to make your final decision, right? So it's not going to be a single step process. None of this is meant to belittle anyone's choice or to belittle any manufacturer. Manufacturers have good reasons for rebranding other machines. I, I understand that. And you might have good reasons for selecting a rebranded tractor. I get that. So, so please, uh, it's just my opinion, and it's just some high-level guidelines. So I, I'm, I'm not at all trying to uh, belittle or badmouth anybody's choice. If you've already chosen your tractor, then you've made the right choice for you. As I said early on, I don't care what tractor you bought, because all of them are going to be lots of fun. Let me know in the comments section if this has been helpful. This may be the end of the series. I have one more topic in mind. But uh, meanwhile, watch closely. We're going to do that live stream uh, where we can take Q&A on your 2022 tractor purchase. We're going to do that very soon. We will publicize that within the next uh, week or so, hopefully. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Tractor Time with Tim. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. These guys have loaded up fencing in this trailer, and they have not tied it down in any sort of fashion. Yeah, we're not going very far. It's just laying there. <laughs> I'm just saying, I do not want to follow that. But you truck. know the, the first rule of, of trailer rules. Oh, we're not we're not going far. Right. <laughs>